All right, so I am here at our uh, mini game jam, and uh, oh, well, so nobody has shown up. Uh, but I figured I will go over this. I prepared a sort of, and it's not supposed to be a presentation. It's kind of a guided process for exploring, beginning to create uh, a game, if that's what you're, what you're looking to do. Um, so uh, I am uh, Michael Bragg, the uh, Denver Game Builders chapter leader. So I will just go over this uh, not presentation, I guess, as a presentation. I'm just going to go through this somewhat quickly. Uh, I guess consider it guidance, guidance for thought uh, or what have you. Um, so, yeah, uh, what the heck is it? Questions to get you started on making your game. Uh, so the, the reason for this title and stuff is it, if you're in a place where say you haven't made a game, you haven't made uh, any particularly complicated piece of software, which, you know, I can remember back to a time when that was the case for me, um, then you might be confused trying to think about, you know, what is, what is my game going to be? Um, so, uh, to start, we'll start off on the broadest level. Uh, let's just say you're thinking about making a game, but you don't know what to make. I think that describes a lot of people. Um, so you may fall into one of a couple of categories. Uh, maybe there's so many ideas that you can't decide what to do, or, or you might have no ideas. Um, it's also quite possible that you might have ideas that you just cannot make. Um, you may not realize that. <laughs> I've been there. Uh, that was my first project in trying to make a game. Uh, it's probably like about three years ago now. But uh, I mean, as long as you give it a try. Anyway, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, anyway, that's looking at the highest level. So let's just say uh, the first question that you can you can pose to yourself if you're just – and Really, if you're looking to make games, the best thing to do is to just start making games. So um, I would say it's better to just use a project and start working on it because you're going to learn a lot from experience. So this is a start from the perspective of answering these questions so you can get started making something. Um, so question one, what type of game do you think you could make with your skill level? And given that, what type of game would you most like to make? So we're looking for the ideal intersection of what you what you can make on, on the one hand and what you would want to make. It seems obvious, but uh, it's a relevant question because if you neglect what you are going to enjoy making, then you might not end up completing it. And if you take on something that you can't really make, you might not get very far. Uh, so th I'm sharing this quote on the temptation to be original. Um, so it's very difficult to achieve this bar of originality, whatever that is, uh, for at the point of just starting out. Um, if you're making your first game first couple of games um so i this is i'm just like trying to warn against the trap of like hesitating or being forever in the, in the space of like trying to come up with an idea or refining the idea because uh you i mean you may have this idea you're thinking about it for years you know and it's, you, let's say you spend five years thinking about this big crazy game that you think you're going to make um you know and if you spend those five years just thinking about it in the back of your head you're not um bringing your skill level any closer to where you could actually execute that whereas if you make one or two small projects a year your your skill level is going to be growing and you bring yourself closer to the point where you could 
even begin to understand what it's going to take to make that game. Uh, so anyway, let's just the I'll share this quote. You're ready. Start making stuff. Um, so this is uh, this quote's from Steel Like an Artist. Um, so yeah, basically just don't be afraid to make something that's derivative. It's better to make your own uh, breakout game. That's what I did. Um, than to not make anything. So here's some simple game ideas um, that you could probably Google for more. Uh, so here's some examples. Breakout, Pong, Snake, Hangman, Tic-Tac-Toe, Defender, Bejeweled, Minesweeper, Asteroids, uh, a Dungeon Crawler RPG, Roguelike RPG. Um, I mean, you, and you could include some type of normal RPG. It's just that an RPG with a lot of events and text can be uh, heavy on assets. I mean, let's say it's a text-based RPG, then the advantage could be that like you could probably generate text, but it could still be a lot of work. Um, so maybe not as simple as it might appear. Okay, so moving beyond that, because we're not really going to... So all these two things were just to add value to this question of like what type of game are you going to make so let's just assume that we had answered that um we'll just say we're going to make snake um so the next thing to consider let's just ask what are what the let's look at the boundaries what are the beginning conditions of the game and what are the ending conditions um so this is a seemingly simple question that might not seem meaningful, but it can be relevant to determining how much to make. Um, and it can save you from making things that aren't really going to be relevant to your project. Uh, so examples, Pong. Uh, so the beginning conditions, the players have no point have no points and the ball is by the starting player's paddle uh the ending and i probably should have said something about the paddles starting in the middle too um so i guess that's sort of making a point by omission it's very easy to overlook stuff and that's probably going to happen anyway but um the more you attempt to uh lay out what everything is going to be the less surprises you'll have and you'll get better at that with practice too. In uh, ending conditions, the player reaches the winning amount of points, um, and that's for Pong. So another example for for Defender: uh, the beginning player is the, at the start of the first level, has max lives and zero points. And the ending conditions uh, could be the player has no lives or reaches the end of the last level. And as you can note there, in this case, there's a couple of different ending conditions. Where, so obviously, it's a slightly more complicated game than Pong, where like Pong is a simple, almost more like a, an electronic version of a parlor game. Whereas, you know, Defender starts to get into the territory of a game that's telling some sort of story and that's why it might have a couple different endings where like you fail or you succeed um why bounds so articulating the bounding conditions of your game can save you time planning and developing materials that are going to be extraneous to the game so this is about uh just doing a little bit to articulate the scope of the game so that can help you avoid spending time developing things that aren't going to make it into the final cut uh, I mean, time is precious, so you want to be careful about sinking energy into things that aren't going to serve the final project, uh, and that can be easy to do. So uh, we'll pass beyond bounding conditions. Uh, if we were going to say uh, beginning conditions, ending conditions, if we're going to make snake, I would probably say the beginning conditions are that we place the snake somewhere around the middle of the screen where it's not immediately in danger of running into an edge and we place uh, a piece of food for the snake set the score to zero 
and that should be about it. Um, so now, the, our next question, what does the main screen look like? Um, so if you're making a simple game, which is pretty much what we're dealing with here, uh, it should probably only have one main screen where most of the gameplay happens. Uh, there, there might be cases where you have like a menu screen or, or something like that, and you may have a start screen, but these are going to be fairly minimal, and you could deal with those separately, but the most of the action should take a, uh, take place on one screen. It's definitely true for Snake, uh, Pong, Breakout, uh, pretty much all of simple games like that. Um, not necessarily as much the case for RPGs, which is another reason why I would not have categorized them as simple games. Uh, so now at this point we would just start designing. So um, we, what I'm recommending here is to just use Draw.io to make uh, this, a mock-up of the screen. And you could also use uh, just pen and paper. Um, I'll demonstrate Draw.io though, and you, you'll you see it's pretty simple. Um, taking back here, I didn't think I had anybody pop in. So uh, I'll ask this question, how rough is rough? You may, uh, I know a lot of people, and I've been there myself, have this sense of like you're you're being asked to do something that's not you're not entirely comfortable with you probably maybe you haven't done it before you haven't made a, a mock-up of a screen you haven't done some of these processes that are in here and you're afraid you might be afraid that whatever you try to do is not really going to be good enough um but really you just got to give it a try uh, we everybody starts out in that place so this is where i kind of came from sharing this quote uh from theodore rothke's poem uh, great nature has another thing to do to you and me so take the lively air and lovely learn by going where to go so we learn by going and that was a horrible reading of the poetry but what can you what can you really ask for so this is my advice with this and really with all these uh, steps is dare to suck. Uh, as the, as the picture implies, just jump in there, get your feet wet. Um, you know, you get, you gotta do it at some point. And there's, you know, there's a chance that you'll make a mistake, but that's fine. Uh, everybody does. And it's, it's what you've learned from making those mistakes, this iterate iterative, process that is how you grow so um let's see let's go over to dryo and i will go ahead and make a mock-up of what this screen could look like for snake and this is going to be incredibly simple so i think that should help demonstrate just how simple that this process can be um Let's see here. We'll just have we have a score at the top of the screen. And, and the the score is gonna have a value. Just say it starts out at zero. And then we'll have our snake that comes in somewhere so he's coming in i'm just gonna give him a color mm, not digging that color quite so let's say that our snake is orange because why not and then um We'll have a little apple or whatever for the snake to eat. And we'll say that gets populated over here. And that's pretty much it. So that's pretty simple for um, the 
purpose of laying out a mock-up for a game like Snake, which is pretty simple. So, see, it's, well, I know, I, obviously I have experience doing this, but so this is draw.io. Um, you can just type in draw draw.io and it'll bring you to it. And you can save your diagrams on Google Drive um, as long as you work on the same computer consistently. You can add shapes to your scratch pad and reuse them. So this is this is good for a lot of things. You can make flow diagrams. You can make screen mockups. Um, so many different things. And I've I've tried to use other programs that are like supposed to be specifically for different types of uh, purposes, like user flows and stuff. And I've ended up coming back to Draw IO many times just because uh this program is is free and like it works so basically um the like you're not going to have this issue where you come back in a few weeks to use your files again and your free trial is over and now you can't access your user flows and stuff so that's an advantage to that so here's a silly diagram um i don't think any of these images are meaningful but these are the processes that we're going over here you know uh, picking an idea and in reality although we're i'm prompting you to do this in one sitting you can do this over the course of uh, you know a month or whatever, but I would encourage a pretty active process in that. And to tr like probably to find some middle ground between um, trying to do something completely original and just doing a total derivative derivative copy. So take a simple game that you can find uh you know whether you find a tutorial for it or you're just looking at a simple game um and then just you know find some simple way that you can put your own twist on it that will make you enjoy uh doing it so it feels like you're doing something that's your own and uh try to like um actively like make time to research and brainstorm and like you know do like put it on a whiteboard or something like this day this time i'm gonna go over ideas and then give yourself a deadline to make a decision so you take you know it does, you don't have to make a decision in a day but be careful about just like letting that float around on the back burner and uh be something that just stays there for years because if you don't make a priority to just do it and give yourself some sort of dev deadline or prompt to like actually do it, then it might never happen. You know, alternatively, you could, you know, participate in some sort of event where people are, you know, making games or, or you know, uh, whatever is going to like give you that push to just get started on something. And then, you know, our steps, pick idea, design layout, and then this one we're going to do now, define models. So defining models, um, and models are basically just the virtual data representations of what you're going to see on screen. So if you're, if you're going to see a spaceship on screen, we need um, data that tells us where, what, how to represent that so that might be uh um a sprite and then we need data for the x and y coordinates of the ship and we might need data for the ship's velocity we might want data on how many lives the player has um maybe to have an energy level things like that and then um, you know, what types of enemies are, are there? What properties do they have? Where are they at? All of these things, again, are they're all contained in models, models. And then we take this information 
that's all stored basically in tables or what you know whatever form and we have um functions that know how to take that data and then give instructions to display uh modules and, and all this sort of stuff to create the end product that the user experiences so why define the models um, and by this i mean why let's say list out what you think all the models are going to be like do this brainstorming exercise and like actually write it down and say yes i'm going to have a, a ship the and the ship is going to have hit points and the ship is going to have uh, speed it's going to have coordinates and all this um so the reason for defining the models ahead of time is to allow you to uh, progress more smoothly when you start work uh, allow you to ha not have to do as much backtracking um you so see you may have you know let's say you are making a game and you have 30 kinds of enemies and you finally get to a certain point in the game in making the game you've already created these 30 different enemies and they're all in 30 different files and that's maybe even an ideal case there may be different representations of those they might there may be 50 different files and then now all of a sudden you decide you want a new attribute on each enemy um you know before all you had was uh hit points on the enemies but then you realize you wanted them to be able to do special moves but only with a limited amount so now you want them to have energy well as so now you have to go back through 50 different files and keep track of which ones you have changed and which ones you haven't um in order to implement this feature you know which is going to completely distract you from moving forward and then you end up with you know your head is in 50 different files in the project and and you're just all over the place and then this could just you know repeat over and over so that your your focus is just really all over the place and you get this feeling like you don't really know what you're doing you're just um scrambling all over the place so uh getting it all figured out ahead of time allows us to move move in a smoother more a little bit more linear fashion i mean everything isn't going to go 100 percent to plan but it allows you to work on one thing at a time which is the best way to do development you you define all these models you try to work with this separation of concerns that you may have heard about and you work on one thing at a time which helps to keep you from um breaking stuff amongst other reasons so let's pose this question what if i make a mistake uh so you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes um and the, the reality is it's not all or nothing so having things 85 percent figured out is is a lot better than zero percent uh so the don't let the fact or the probability that you're gonna make a mistake stop you like yeah you're gonna make a mistake and you know it's not a big deal um you, you'll figure it out you know uh okay so just try to guess what you'll need you know um just give it a try and the reality is that it's not whether you fail like you you try to do stuff and when you're starting from a point where you don't know anything, yeah, you're going to fail. And then, um, you know, you, you it's not whether you fail, it's how you fail. And then you learn from that failure and you move forward. Um, so, yeah, feeling unsure is normal. Failing is just part of the process. So how does this become a game? all of these you know the models that you might have uh listed out and a screen and uh, you know a genre and maybe a, a layout for stuff um 
So in order to start making your game, focus on the part of the models that is the most essential for the starting conditions of the game. So as an example, let's think about Defender. The starting condition, the player is at the start of the first level, has maximum lives and zero points. So in an, in an analysis of the dependencies in the situation, lives is a dependency of the player and points requires a player and enemy, unless the points are equal to zero. So it's pretty simple to set the points equal to zero and to display them. That's one way to go. So you have a couple of options for the first thing to do. Um, you could define points and display the starting value, which would give you one thing that it would be done. Um, or you could define the player and just display the starting values as text, which at least gives you a, a certain validation that you entered everything correctly. Now, from there, you might focus on uh, creating the screen, uh, the ability to display. So if you were going to do Defender, you'd probably use a canvas display or something. If you're going to develop it with JavaScript, you would use an HTML canvas or you would use a game engine like Phaser. Um, so you would probably start off by loading the player sprite the ship and then you would um, work on being able to control it you know, to control the ship with whatever input devices you wanted and then you might start working on you know other things that's that's a pretty good start uh, and it probably take a decent amount of work so it's nothing to sniff at um so how do you structure things how do you, what is a program? If you haven't done a lot of coding or software design, you might be wondering what your program is supposed to look like. Uh, so it's a tricky question. Most of the time, it's not just like one huge file. It's gonna be like a lot of files that are broken up and organized in, in a given way. So you, we have a couple of different main types of structures for games. You have an event-driven structure. Um, where you might have an initializing function tied to a start button that creates the initial conditions um, for the game. So uh, I would say definitely like tic-tac-toe, hangman, these would be like that kind of game. You press the start button, it's going to set the values so that you haven't made any mistakes yet on hangman. And it will just display the gallows it won't display any parts of the guy being hanged and all the all the letters will be available and you'll uh the game will use whatever library and process it has for choosing a word and it will display blank letters equal to the letters in the word and then you'll be ready to go um then from there, events triggered by inputs alter the model, prompting a display. So each input would have uh, an event listener attached to it that calls uh, a function somewhere. And the function can have access to whatever parts of the program that we want to have it. So it could it could ask for information about other areas of the game um, and then you know do some calculations produce an output and then you know request to change the the state of a value like okay now the user chose the letter g uh, then it checks to see if g is in the word okay g is not in the word so we're gonna now say we need to put g in the in the pool of letters that are not valid and um, add add one step to the hangman like uh, figure. Uh, and then that would all go back to the display, which would normally be pretty much set up. So yeah, it it should be it should be pretty simple. It varies. It depends on how you um, work at everything so but ultimately 
Uh, there's no like watcher event that's like always running. It, it just waits for inputs and then it would call a constrained uh, method that works based off of whatever the type of input is so it does a certain thing within the game logic. Okay, I don't think that I'm explaining that more, so I'm going to move on to real-time structure. So a real-time game, in a real-time game, again, you still probably have a start button, and then that's going to set initial states, so behind the scenes, you're going to have methods that load the assets into the game, initialize required variables to their starting values, and populate game objects. So it's one thing to note is that there is a difference between assets and game objects. So uh, taking, for instance, like a little alien guy that might be an enemy in Defender, the uh, the sprite for that alien guy would be like an asset, but the uh, a game many game objects could be initialized using that sprite, and each game object is going to have its own um, variables, its own statistics. So each one could have, if it has hit points, it might it would have that value. Otherwise, whenever it gets hit, it may just be destroyed. Uh, remove itself from the game. But anyway, so that's the difference between assets and game objects. So then once the starting logic is complete, it's going to render the game and your rendered state. In the rendered state, you have all of your game objects with whatever applied physics are affecting them that will be moving based off of uh, some sort of update state. If you have, uh, if you're using a game engine, then there's probably physics behind the scenes that are going to handle a lot of that. You'll still have access to the ability to create update methods that you could check for different things that might have occurred, and this this is going to be run with a certain periodicity. So it might be the update method may be run like 30 times a second, and it'll just process whatever you, is put in there. Uh, and then based on that, that may alter um, whatever is, is in this rendered state. So a simple example might be uh, objects that only exist for a given amount of time. So they their timer ticks down, and then when it finally hits, when their timer is finally up in the update method, it'll trigger instructions to uh, delete that object from the scene and that comes back to the state, and then they're not there anymore. So another way that the state can be affected is with collisions or events. So, I mean, that's pretty simple. Uh, let's, you might have a collider on a bullet, and the, you know, the bullet go, hits a, a relevant game object that it's, it's scripted to affect, and that triggers a collision event, which will then check for whatever it needs to do, and that might alter the state. So this is still within update or collisions and any background physics stuff that's going on. It's pretty distributed. So um, depending on the way the code is structured and the uh, game engine, you may have like scripts in the game objects and whatever. Uh, and again, I feel I've arrived at the point where I don't know that I'm really uh, clarifying things, so I'll probably wrap up on that. I'm um, just reading my description to see if I miss anything. No? Okay. So, what type of structure will your game have? Um, yeah, so just think about which, which type of structure, whether it's turn-based or, I, sorry, event-based or uh, real-time. Is going to work best for your game and maybe there are some other uh, modalities out there i don't know um but those are those are two prominent options so turn-based games like rpgs um 
I could think of some other examples like detective games and things like that might be work well with um uh, a an event driven structure um action based games like arcade games platformers shooters are uh, probably need to be real time all right well that's that's pretty much it so i guess if you are watching this after the fact and you have questions then uh comment or pose them in some form if possible and I shall endeavor to answer. And that is it for the presentation.